Welcome back to the Favourites podcast. Um, lovely to have you back with us and apologies for uh, there being a bit of a hiatus in uh, in doing these podcasts um, through November and, and December. I did have some plans to do some things but um, then we had some family circumstances. Sadly my father-in-law uh, and then my mum passed away uh, at the end of November, start of, of December. And there was a lot of travelling up and down the country, including to uh, visit uh, mum in hospital and to, to sort out arrangements and things and to see the rest of the family. Um, so we've had a bit of a, a pause, uh, but we're back again. Um, and my intention through uh, the new year was to start looking at some... Uh, some systematic theology with you, uh, some doctrine, the, the key beliefs that we have as, as Christians. And uh, in this first series, we're going to start with a, a doctrine of revelation. We're going to be looking at the question, how can we know about God? How do we know? Now, that's the theme uh, for a number of weeks ahead, as we begin to look at the whole uh, question of how we know truth about God, how we know truth about us, and in fact, the truth about everything. To start us off, I wanted to give a bit of background really about why Faith Roots exists, uh, both in terms of the podcasts, uh, live events that we do from time to time, either online or in person. Uh, before the pandemic, we used to do uh, a quarterly Faith Roots Live where we uh, ran teaching workshops on a, on a Saturday uh, breakfast and then a, and, and then a workshop on a, on a particular theme or subject. Now, why did we start doing this? Uh, well, there were two motivations. One was my concern to help equip uh, Christians for gospel service, particularly into urban priority areas. Uh, being aware that Christians were looking for more teaching, more equipping, more training, uh, but for all sorts of reasons wouldn't be able to access um, seminary, to go to a theological college and pay uh, four or five thousand pounds, sometimes more, uh, to study for two or three years. On the other side of things was my belief that theology, doctrine, systematic theology, biblical theology, that church history, all those kinds of things, was and is the property of the church, and all Christians should be able to have access to these things. And that meant that there was more that uh, people might want to learn and should be able to learn uh, than we could teach in a, in a Sunday morning sermon. And my reason uh, was this. On my bookcase behind me, you'll see that I've got lots and lots of of books. And some of them are, are nice slim paperbacks and some of them are big, heavy books. And what we tend to do is we tend to think that doctrine, theology, is about the big, heavy books. It's about theory. It's about academy uh, 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 and uh, about the academy and about being academic and intellectual and not to do with the real world. And then we assume that those thin and um, brighter coloured books, that they are to do with real life, to do with pastoral application and uh, self-help and how to live and how to face the workplace or the school or how to build healthy relationships and those kinds of things. And often there's a big dichotomy, a divide between the two. That we think that doctrine, that theology belongs over here and has nothing to do with the world, real world over here. Uh, now, I believe it, it's the catchphrase, if you like, for faith roots. I believe this, that what we believe affects how we live. Uh, that actually, if we want to live well, if we want to know God and to live for him in a way that pleases him, if we want to find... Um, the meaning of, of life, meaning and purpose and satisfaction and enjoyment, then we need to be clear about what we believe. I'm going to explain a bit about why that is so 
in this podcast. Uh, so we have got some slides. I'm going to go to them now. Obviously, some of you are listening aud uh, through audio and the absence of the slides uh, for you won't affect things, but you can pick up a lot of this material from the website as well. So here are our starting points. I want to talk through um, a, a diagram um, that I've uh, seen in um, in psychology books, actually, in um, books about um, particularly about cognitive behavioural therapy. So books about therapy, and uh, if you are watching, you will see this up on your screen now. If you are listening to the audio version, then if you go to um, faithfruit.com, go to the publications page and you will find that there is a publication called How Do We Know? And this diagram appears in there. Now, this is the basis for an approach to counselling, an approach to therapy called cognitive behavioural therapy. And it starts on this premise, uh, that we live in the world around us. Um, and call it the environment. We have an environment around us and we're constantly interacting with it. We interact with uh, the impersonal environment, with um, the weather, with um, uh, the physical terrain. We, we interact physically with those things. Uh, but we also interact because we are seeing as well as touching and we are hearing and we are reading and we are interpreting that environment. And we do that with our minds. We process, we think things through, we interpret, we sort, we analyse. So we have our cognition, all of those thoughts that are going on. And that means that we have beliefs uh, from the data uh, that comes to us and that process of interpretation we reach conclusions about what we believe about ourselves and about the world around us. So there's our cognition. Um, but there is also what we might refer to as effect our emotional states, how we feel, whether we are happy or sad, excited or frightened. And our emotions, the effect, are linked to our cognition, to our beliefs. What we believe and what we think will affect how we feel. Now, don't worry, we're going to go back through some of these in a bit more detail shortly. I just want to give you the whole picture. And then there's our physiology, our bodily state, uh, whether we are physically fit, uh, whether we are tired, whether we are ill, or whether we're alert. Um, the Adrenaline, whether that's pumping or not. And did you know that there is a two-way relationship between physiology and effect, between our body and our emotions? Our emotions are affected by how we are doing physically, uh, but also how we are doing physically is affected by our emotions. And then there's a fourth factor, behaviour, what we do and what we say. Now, our behaviour is being affected by what we believe. If I believe something to be true, I will behave in one way. If I believe it to be false, I'll act in another way. Our behaviour is also affected by our feelings and our behaviour is affected by how we're doing physically. 
Uh, so let's talk some of those things. And you will notice that the, the connecting lines connect all of these. So what we believe affects our emotions and our physical state and our behaviour. Uh, but also our beliefs can be affected by our bodily state and by our emotions. And even our behaviour will affect how we live. So if what I believe affects how I live, it is also true to say that how I live will affect what I believe. Let's give some examples. If I've got into the habit, for whatever reason, of isolating myself away from others and sleeping in the daytime and waking up at midnight and then going back to sleep again, and there may be all sorts of reasons why that has happened, then that is going to affect my emotions. I am more likely to feel lonely and sad. And the two together is going to start to affect me physically. I am going to be more tired, more lethargic, less awake, less physically fit. Which incidentally is going to create this vicious cycle that because of that, because I'm tired, because I'm less alert, because I'm more lethargic, I'm more likely to feel down and I'm more likely to keep staying indoors. Behaviours become reinforced. And if that's my life, if that is my physical state, if that's how I'm behaving, and that's how I'm feeling, I'm increasingly likely to believe things about the world, to believe that I am isolated, and that that means that nobody cares, nobody loves me. And as I look at myself and I look at my and I feel lethargic and I don't feel good about myself, I'm going to believe as well that because of that, I am unlovely, I am unlovable. It affects what I believe about me and about the world. And it is highly likely that I'm going to transpose those beliefs onto God as well. Uh, that I'm likely to believe that God does not love me either. That God is distant. That the world around me is frightening and dangerous. And that therefore God also is frightening and dangerous, that he doesn't care. And I may even start to believe that he is to blame. So that's one way that it can work. Here's another way. If we start with cognition, if I believe because of what people have told me that nobody loves me, including God, that God doesn't love me. And I grow that belief and dwell on it. It's going to affect my emotions, isn't it? It's going to cause me to despair and to feel sad. That may encourage me in my behaviour to become withdrawn. And as I do, I am likely to experience that sense of tiredness and weakness so that it affects me physically. Uh, now, cognitive behavioural therapy is, is a secular um, approach to counselling and therapy. 
that assumes that all of these things are, are linked together. And that behaviour and emotions and physical health are linked and that they're related to our thoughts and our beliefs. So, in fact, cognitive behavioural therapy says, well, where are we going to start? We've got to start somewhere in there. And the best place actually to start if we want to see real change is with cognition. It's with thoughts and beliefs. And I find that fascinating. We're going to come back to the uh, the main screen so you can see me again if you're watching. I find that fascinating. Uh, and the reason I find it fascinating is this, because that starts to link up with things that we are aware of as Christians, uh, that a secular philosophy has stumbled onto truth that we already knew. Uh, that our whole lives are affected by our beliefs, by uh, our faith or absence of faith. Uh, they're affected by our relationship to truth. And that's why I personally think that if we're going to help people with their lives, we need to get away from that disconnect between the, the doctrine, what we believe, and the practical, the pastoral stuff, how we live. And uh, the solution that we need is to learn the deep truths about God and what God has to say. If we want to know how to live, we need to hear what God has to say to us. And that's so important because we live in a, a messy world. A world that is often chaotic and even violent. We've just lived through a, a global pandemic which was terribly frightening, uh, that disrupted our lives and that caused us great pain and grief as we lost loved ones. And the world is barely starting to recover from that. And even as it tries to recover, we're hit with further one. It's a cost of living crisis here in Britain, exacerbated by a horrendous conflict in Ukraine. Regardless of what is happening in the, world, the wider world, uh, there's the pain and struggle and suffering that so many of us face in our own lives, whether that's a, a battle with disease, whether that's difficult relationships, whether that's the scars of past damage done to us. And then there's the self-inflicted wounds through sin that brings guilt and shame. Uh, so we live messed up lives in a messed up, messy world. How are we meant to navigate our way out of that or through that? Well, that's where what we believe comes in. It's where it matters. I want to suggest that there are four things, four focal points, if you like, for what we believe. Four big questions that we are all seeking answers to. Now, these are four questions that Mike Ovey, when he was uh, the doctrine tutor and then the principal at Oak Hill Theological College, uh, used to ask, and, and he summed doctrinal systematic theology up as being about this, answering these four questions. Here they are. Who is God? And what is God like? What is creation and what is it like? Who am I? And what am I like? What does it mean to be human? And then what does the future hold? What is does, does it all end here or is there more than this? What is the new creation and what will it be like? Uh, 
And in fact, as we work through our systematic theology, through our doctrine, those are the four big questions that we will come to answer after we've gone through this first section. How do we know? Uh, you see, there are two options with each of these. When we're seeking to answer the question, who is God and what is he like? We have a choice. We can either believe truth about God, or we can believe lies about God. And that's the same for me. I can, for, for being human, I can believe truth about me and truth about humanity, or I can believe lies about me. I can believe truth about creation, or I can believe lies about creation. And that's the big decision that we have got to, to make. Am I going to believe truth or am I going to believe lies? That's what we're going to be thinking about. Uh, so I can believe truth about God. I can believe that God is sovereign that he is all-powerful, that he's majestic, that he's wonderful. And I can believe that God is good, that God is great and that God is good, that he is just and holy, that he is love, that he's compassionate and merciful. Um, I can believe those things, those truths, or I can believe lies. I can either believe that God is weak, that God is not great, to the point where I, I may end up believing that God does not exist at all, that God is absent, that God is distant, that God is impersonal, uh, that there is no God. Or I can choose to believe that there is a God, and he is great, he's strong, he's powerful, but that he is not good, that he isn't love, that he's cruel, that he lies that he does not love me. I can choose to believe truth about me. I can believe that I am made in God's image. That is truth. Fearsome and wonderfully made. I, I can believe that I was made in his image uh, to fill and subdue creation. That's what Genesis says. I can believe that I was made to be part of a community of a human race, made for a relationship that I need God, that I'm meant to worship him, and that I need others as well. Those are truths that I can believe about myself. And I can also believe that because of sin, I am fallen. That I need a saviour. Or I can choose to believe lies about me. I, I can believe that I just evolved by chance. Uh, I, I can believe that um, I am not made in God's image, that I am just another animal, just a, just a beast, uh, that I don't have value and dignity. Uh, but I can also end up believing um, that I am somehow so special, so invincible that I don't need others. And I can choose to believe the lie that the, the fall that sin has had no effect on me. Those are lies I can believe about myself. Similarly, creation. I can believe that creation is good, ordered, made by a loving God, uh, but subject to the fall. Or I can believe lies. I can deny the fall, so I can ignore the fact that sin has had an effect on creation. Or I can believe, as the Gnostics did, that physical matter that creation is bad that is evil i can believe that it's all chaotic and messy and unpredictable similarly i may choose to believe that there is a future that there is a new creation to come or i may believe the lie that it all finishes here and and you as you were hearing those options those truths and those lies will begin to 
will be beginning to put the jigsaw pieces together and, and be seeing how if I choose to believe a lie about God or about me or about creation or new creation, it is going to affect how I feel and how I behave and that is going to affect the whole person. It will even affect me physically. And we're going to be tracing some of those things through. So we will be looking at the doctrine, what we believe, uh, but it will not be separated out from the practicalities of life. So every time we look at a belief, a truth, and we see how it counters a lie, we will then ask the question, so what? Uh, we will answer with, this is important, this matters, because, and we will apply it to all kinds of life situations. So I want you to come on a journey with me over the next few weeks and months as we begin to explore this further. Uh, and as I said, the starting point has got to be this. If there is truth about God and creation and humanity and new creation, and there are lies about those things, how do we know what the truth is? And how do we know what the lies are? How do we discern? And that's why we're starting with that first big question how do we know? And next time we're going to be looking a bit more at the two main ways that we can attempt to know. And there are really two options. One is that I try to work things out for myself, observe and reason and deduce. And the other option is that I am dependent on revelation. I'm dependent on God from the outside speaking in and telling me. Let's join us then.